Hi, my name is Jacob Hoster. I'm a third year PhD student from Case Western Reserve University studying under Dr. Julie Renner. I'm here to talk to you about a high throughput method for analyzing struvite formation and morphology, exploring the effect of peptide additives. To give this presentation some perspective, I first want to talk about why we should care about phosphorus. The majority of phosphorus is mined from phosphate rock, which is a non-renewable resource. Yes, yeah, phosphate rock is the source of nearly all phosphate used in commercial fertilizers. The demand for phosphate rock will continue to increase as the global population and thus the food demand increases, which will likely lead to supply shortage within a century. Up to 40% of applied phosphorus fertilizer is lost due to runoff into rivers, lakes, and streams. Aside from being wildly inefficient, the excess phosphorus contributes significantly to eutrophication and algae blooms that harm aquatic life. The necessity of recovering lost phosphorus is often overlooked in treating wastewater systems, where the phosphorus is seen as a contaminant rather than a valuable resource. The impending phosphorus crisis will be fully realized unless this attitude is changed and technologies are rapidly developed to recover phosphorus. So struvite is one of the ways to recover phosphate from wastewater streams. Struvite is a slow release fertilizer composed of magnesium, ammonium, and phosphate that precipitates readily out of solution at basic pH. Magnesium and ammonium are also valuable components of fertilizer for further add adding to struvite's value. The slow release character of struvite fertilizer is valuable because it allows for lower amounts of phosphorus runoff. However, struvite can also be viewed as a nuisance because it is often found in alkaline streams of wastewater treatment plants where struvite growth can occlude pipes and cause damage. Currently, struvite is formed by a chemical precipitation from wastewater where magnesium salts are often added and the pH is adjusted with sodium hydroxide or aeration. Ammonia and phosphate are typically at high enough concentrations such that no salt, salt supplement for those two need to be added, but the addition of chemicals adds cost to the process which can be undesirable. However, there is evidence that precipitation can occur at more moderate pH than the more typical basic pH, and some waste streams have sufficiently high magnesium content such that no additional chemicals need to be added. So one last bit of background before I get into the high throughput method, what are peptides? Peptides are a biopolymer composed of amino acids. Over here on the left, you can see a generic amino acid. There are 20 natural amino acids that share this general structure, an N-terminus, a C-terminus, and a variable R group. So the chemistry of the R group can vary between hydrophobic to hydrophilic and charged to uncharged. So when amino acids are polymerized, an N-terminus bonds to a C-terminus via amide bond. A relatively short polymer of amino acids is known as a peptide. So over on the right, you can see a peptide, which is actually the peptide we used in this study. By controlling the type and location of amino acids, the peptide can be designed to have high binding specificity for a ligand or material. For this study, we found that using a peptide initially designed for enamel regrowth, which enamel is largely hydroxyapatite, induced favorable changes in struvite formation. This peptide was initially promising due to the presence of phosphate in both struvite and hydroxyapatite, along with chemical similarities between the magnesium and struvite and the calcium and hydroxyapatite. The peptide interacts with one of those groups on hydroxyapatite. We propose it may play a role in struvite mineralization. So why are these so important in precipitation processes? Because they may help precipitate. So the main tool used in this work was using absorbance to probe struvite formation. To accomplish this, 96 well plates, which you can see a little schematic on the right, were used in conjunction with a plate reader. This enabled us to examine small volumes, less than 200 microliters, with multiple wells reacting at a time. It could run up to 96 wells, depending on the limits of the plate reader. The foundation of this work is shown on the graph on the left. By putting a known amount of struvite in the wells and measuring the absorbance, we were able to fit the data to a linear model. There is some scattering seen, but that's just due to the heterogeneous distribution of struvite in the wells. By taking the average over multiple data points, we get a representative absorbance for a given concentration of struvite. We were then able to track struvite formation as a function of time, as shown in the center graph, which we were then able to fit to a first-order kinetic model with induction time, which is just a lag time before the exponential growth period, and it's typical of crystal precipitation. The formula can be seen above the 96 well plate image. So the tau is the induction time, uh, y naught is the yield parameter, or the ultimate yield of the system, and k is the formation constant, which corresponds to how long the system takes to reach its max. To obtain reliable and reproducible results, we also had to introduce a small amount of struvite seed crystals into each well just to give the system something to go on. 
So after establishing the system can be modeled through a first order kinetic model, we move to investigate the effect of peptide additives. So generally the peptides significantly increase the yield parameter. So you can see on the graph on the left, indicating a larger amount of struvite was present at the end of the experiment. The increase in yield parameter was not significantly dependent on the peptide dose of the levels tested. So the letters at below the bars refer to the statistical group the data sets belong to according to a post hoc test on an ANOVA. So at the 95% confidence level, we can say they're different. Uh, any bars that don't share a letter are significantly different than each other. The increase in yield shows a thermodynamic effect of peptide addition. Speculate that the peptide bonds to specific bases of struvite crystals with previous literature showing change, complex changes in local oversaturation and free energy occur when peptides bind to crystals. The formation constant decreased when the experiment was conducted in the presence of any amount of peptide within the concentration range studied, which you can see in the center indicating that the reaction reached steady state at a slower rate than the case with no peptide. The induction time increased only when the peptide dose became comparatively large, with no significant decrease between the moderate peptide dose and no peptide, as seen on the graph on the right. We speculate that at high doses, the peptide could be increasing the free energy barrier for early crystal nucleation and growth, thus leading to higher induction time. Thus, it can be seen that using this peptide as an additive in struvite precipitation induces changes in the formation kinetics. So after that, we wanted to examine the morphology of the crystals. So we imaged the crystals through optical microscopy and our awesome undergrad Olivia manually traced out the crystals on image J to obtain measurements. So the scale bar on the images is 100 microns and the image on the left is that the crystals grown with no peptide and the one on the right is the crystals grown in the presence of peptide. So the area, perimeter, and length are all statistically the same for the peptide and no peptide case. However, the width and aspect ratio of the struvite crystals formed in the presence and absence of peptide are statistically different. So the crystals precipitated in the presence of the peptide had a larger aspect ratio than the crystals not exposed to peptide. So you can kind of see that the crystals look longer when there's peptide precedent, this result can be used to explain the differences seen on the last slide where the peptide is found to induce changes in the formation constant versus no peptide conditions. It has been shown previously that flat crystals correspond to high growth kinetics and stick-like crystals correspond to slower growth kinetics. This can be seen in our study as precipitation without peptide promotes a lower aspect ratio crystal and has faster growth kinetics. To ensure the crystal seen were actually struvite, we analytically examined them through ATR, FTAR, to collect this spectra, we first put the crystals on a PBDF membrane backing, just so we could actually make sure that the crystals got to the FTIR. Comparing our samples to a standard struvite from this database, we see very good alignment. Um, you can see residual PBDF peaks in our samples just because it was present as a backing. So, through FTIR, we are convinced that we are making struvite in our high throughput method. The impact of seed concentration on struvite precipitation kinetic parameters was then investigated in the absence and presence of peptide. The yield parameter seen on the left increases with increasing seed dosage in the presence of peptide, while in the absence of peptide, an increase only occurs between the last two concentrations tested. Previous literature has stated that less energy is required to grow a crystal on a seed than is required to nucleate a crystal, with increasing seed concentration, increasing struvite recovery due to a lower energy barrier. The presence of peptide increases the yield at high enough seed loadings, further suggesting an interaction between the peptide and the faces of the struvite crystals. The center panel shows that seed has no impact on the formation constant in the presence of peptide, but shows that formation constant is significantly dependent on the seed dose in the absence of peptide. The figure on the right shows that no clear trends exist for the induction time, whether or not the peptide was introduced. Overall, this highlights the need to explore potential interactions when additives are present to achieve the desired results. To further highlight the utility of the high throughput platform, a two level full factorial design with n equals three was conducted to analyze the effect of magnesium dose, mixing time, seed dose, pH, and temperature on the final struvite yield. This graph shows the normal probability plot of the standardized effects. 
this is where we expect all the effects to fall. If they fall far enough from this line, they become significant effects. The results of the factorial design show that there's a strong negative influence of temperature. As the temperature increases, the yield of struvite decreases. This can be readily explained by the increasing solubility of struvite with increased temperature. Temperature shows synergistic negative effects with pH, magnesium dose, and seed dose. So this is likely due to the effect temperature has on each individual parameter, where the pH of a solution depends on temperature, as given by the Nernst equation. The seed is more soluble at higher temperatures, and the mean ionic activity coefficient is lower at higher temperatures. The combination of decreased solubility as pH increases and increased precipitation as magnesium increases leads to a positive interaction between magnesium dose and pH. Increasing the amount of seed also increases the final yield of struvite. The remainder of the combinations did not fall far enough from the standard normal distribution, which is the line, indicating that at the 95% confidence level, the effect on struvite precipitation is not significant. How the peptide functions is a subject for further investigation. There is no evidence that the peptide binds strongly to component ions in solution, as shown through the QCM graph on the right. So the way QCM works is you flow a solution past a gold sensor. When something sticks to the sensor, the frequency drops. When something comes back off the sensor, the frequency goes back up. So we first added peptide, we saw our frequency drop as our peptide stuck to the solution. We tried to rinse it off and it didn't really rinse off, so it's stuck to the sensor. And then we tried different salt solutions and different combinations of salts. And essentially we saw that any salt added, the frequency went down indicating some salt stuck to the surface, but then it rinsed right back off. So there was nothing holding it to the surface. Mixture one was magnesium and phosphate ions, while mixture two was ammonium and phosphate ions. The dissipation shown on the graph in the gray corresponds to viscoelastic characteristics of the adsorbed material. Um, it's not super important for this specific study. The QCM data show that after the immobilized peptide is exposed to the various salt solutions, you go to the, back to the baseline so nothing's sticking. Therefore, the ions do not strongly adsorb to the peptide layer on gold, suggesting there is no strong interaction between the peptide and ions in solution. The ions had similar behavior on a gold sensor without the peptide present, implying that the frequency changes are just due to nonspecific adsorption of the ions to gold. CD spectroscopy and isothermal titration calorimetry also showed no evidence of peptide binding to any component ions. We thus hypothesize that the peptide anchors to the crystal's surface to modulate growth. This could help also explain why the aspect ratio changes when the peptide is present. Computational studies will likely be needed to further explore this interaction. In conclusion, a high-throughput platform was created to study the formation and morphology of struvite with and without peptide additives. Formation was modeled by a first-order kinetic model with induction time to allow for a quantitative assessment of kinetic parameters. It was seen that the presence of peptide increased the yield and decreased the formation constant in a non-dose-dependent way in the concentration range tested. The morphological study revealed slower precipitation corresponded to narrower crystals with peptide present. Together, it can be seen that the peptide is a promising additive for struvite growth. In the future, we want to elucidate the mechanism of peptide, use our platform to identify and screen other potential peptide additives, and test more complex water matrices. Taking questions, here's a nice photo of our group. So. I am right here um, in this picture where the R groups of a peptide, and here's the funding that supported me. 